All right, welcome. I'm Ryan Holger with TEC. Thanks for joining us today. This is part three of a five-part series. Um, if you have not joined us before and you happen to be watching this as the recorded version, I would encourage you to disconnect now, go back and watch part one first from uh, November 18th. Watch that one first and then come back and watch this one. That one's kind of the precursor for the other four. And you can watch any of the other, fours that you, other four that you need. This one's going to have a focus on indoor sporting venues, whereas the one this morning was restaurants and the one on November 18th was kind of the general overview. Tomorrow, if you're interested, is uh, K through 12 schools in the morning. And then tomorrow afternoon is stuff you can do at your own house. You guys ask me any questions that you want. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'm totally game for whatever. So type stuff in and I'll check it every few minutes and see if we can answer stuff. Uh, the main things that we want to focus on for these fitness centers, in addition to all the stuff we said on the general session, is the ventilation requirements, demand ventilation systems, and what we want to do with or without those, how to deal with the extra latent moisture that's generated in a fitness facility, and what we can do, a couple of different solutions to purify the air uh, to make it better for our athletes and our occupants. So the kind of facilities that we're talking about can be a wide range of things. Uh, it could be your typical, you know, traditional gymnasium, uh, basketball courts, volleyball courts, futsal, whatever it is, uh, sports venues like that. It could be fitness centers where people are working out. Uh, these are significantly more difficult to deal with than say a gym like this, because in, 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 in these gym sports, you're already kind of sort of distanced to a degree. Um, you're only touching the ball and that's all you're really all touching. Whereas in the fitness center, everybody's touching everything. So most of the fitness centers have already done a good job with providing cases and cases of wipes so people can wipe equipment down in between uses and spacing people out and using every other treadmill and all that kind of stuff. And most of you guys on here probably already get that side of it. We're gonna focus specifically in today's webinar on HVAC related solutions. So whatever you guys are doing with masks and alcohol wipes and all that, that's that's great and it's it's awesome, but it's not related to what we're going to cover. We're going to focus on what we can do to supplement that by doing better on the HVAC side. So fitness centers are a particular a challenge for us. Uh, combat sports are definitely a challenge because you're not only touching the equipment and touching the mats, the same mats someone else touched, but you're also touching each other. Uh, touching each other, we can't fix that on the HVAC side. But believe it or not, we can actually do stuff to help keep the mats and the punching bags and stuff like that a little bit cleaner. Does that mean you never mop the mat? No, dude, of course you mop the mat. Does that mean you never wipe down the punching bag? No, of course you wipe down the punching bag. But uh, you can do a little bit better with having continuous cleaning via the airstream. And we'll talk about how to do that. And then what we're not really going to think about too much today is large indoor fields like domes and stuff like that. For starters, if you've ever been in a dome, uh, you probably know the building's inflated. If not, it's kind of obvious it's inflated. There's two giant air handlers on the side of every one of those things. One air handler alone can inflate the whole building. It's doing it with nearly 100% outside air. There's a ton of fresh air in an indoor dome. Uh, so the dome is pretty much outdoors to begin with. Obviously, it's shielded from uh, rain and snow, and it's tempered a little bit. But it's pretty much outdoor air. It's pretty, it's pretty clean in there, and there's not a lot of people density. It's a huge volume of space for what is a relatively small amount of people. Whereas a fitness center, it's typically a lot of people in a much shorter, lower volume space. So less air movement to share between each other. That doesn't mean the stuff we're talking about won't work in an indoor field, it will. Uh, it's just not gonna be as good as those other three categories that I, that I had mentioned. So first off, how much ventilation air do we need? Uh, if you joined us for any of the other topics, you know that we're gonna defer over to ASHRAE standard 62.1. Uh, ASHRAE is American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning Engineers, and that's why we call it ASHRAE. That group defines all kinds of things related to HVAC and specifically indoor air quality and ventilation. Uh, there's also the International Mechanical Code. Coincidentally, or not coincidentally, on purpose, it has all the exact same ventilation tables that we have in the ASHRAE standard. And almost every municipality adopts the International Mechanical Code. So pretty much every city or county, and sometimes even entire states, that you work in uh, will be following some version of the IMC. City of Chicago is different. They write their own code, but most places don't like to write their own code, so they copy this code. So when it comes to fitness centers, we blow this table up. This table's four or five pages. We're just going to look at this section here related to sports and entertainment because a couple of these things do apply to what we're doing. 
I know looking at tables is not super interesting to you guys or even to me, but you don't have to look at all this stuff. What you need to focus on is the CFM per person and the CFM per square foot. The leaders don't matter because we don't care about metric around here. And all these other values over here aren't related to what we're doing today. CFM per person, CFM per square foot. It's two numbers and you have to add them together because the density of people makes a difference. So we have a CFM per person amount of outdoor fresh ventilation air that we're required to bring into every type of building to dilute down people things. So when people come in, they bring in germs and dirt and weird cologne and whatever else on them that we need to dilute that down and make that go away. And then the building itself, we want to dilute down. It is off gassing stuff from the paint and the furnishings and whatever else you have in there. So we want to dilute that down. And so we look at those two numbers. If you have a, a very large space with hardly any people, then the people part, the CFM per person is small, but the, the square footage part gets big and then vice versa. So the ones we want to look at today specifically, uh, this first one, gym, sports area, and then it says play area in parentheses. The athletic area is separated from the spectator area. So now if you're the United Center, that's a big deal. You got a very small gym floor and this giant seating area, and you got to treat those different. But if you're a, a small uh, gym that has three basketball courts, like a YMCA or something like that, it's pretty much all basketball court. There's not really any spectator area usually. So for today's purposes, we're going to look at the gym floor area. You need 20 CFM for each person that's going to be in there and 0.18 CFM per square foot. Those are both very, very, very large numbers and much larger than almost every other type of space that we deal with. Larger than uh, offices, larger than retail, larger than restaurants, even larger than schools, larger than daycares. And daycares are one of the most uh, required, highest requirements for ventilation. Gyms almost the highest. Um, so it's a lot of ventilation air. So that means it is expensive to heat and cool it when it comes in from outside, which is why a lot of facilities have kind of, I don't want to say cheated. They probably didn't know the rules, but probably have not been doing the code amounts. And now we need to get back up to the code amounts. Because the last thing I want to do is open a facility and have somebody get sued because I didn't have the right HVAC thing going on. Um, now I realize a lot of you guys are open right now with your fitness centers and gyms. And some of you may be closing back down again, the way the state's been going. If you're in Illinois, like I am, it's been pretty rough and it's getting rougher and rougher. I think we go to tier three tomorrow, which makes it even harder for you guys to stay open. So whether you should or should not follow the, uh, the state rules and guidelines, I don't care about that. I mean, if you want to follow them, great. If you don't want to follow them, great. I don't care either way. But if you're going to be open with or without the state guidelines telling you you can, I want you to do it in a safe way. Right. So we're going to have a lot of ventilation air for these gym floor areas. Um, if I look at the health club areas. So aerobics and weight room. Now, if you say, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a boxing facility. OK, you still fall under aerobics. Uh, oh, I'm a I'm a I'm a biking thing or I'm a, I have a, I'm a, a boutique row house. It still falls under this aerobics room as far as the code goes. They don't have an infinite amount of buckets on here. So that's because this, the activity level that you're doing for aerobics or weightlifting is similar to what you're doing for bike riding and rowing and anything like that or combat sports. So I need in those cases 20 CFM per person and 0 0.06 CFM per square foot. Not quite as much as I need for the gym floor area, a little bit less on, on the building side of the equation. Why are these ventilation rates so high for these kind of activities? Well, if you think about it, there's multiple things going on. The occupants aren't just sitting at their desk typing away on a computer like I am today. They are touching all kinds of stuff. They're moving around, they're stirring things up. As you walk across floor surfaces, you stir up debris that has settled down. If you're at an office and you're sitting down most of the time, you're not stirring that much up. But if you're walking around, running around, moving around, touching things, you're stirring debris constantly. So the more people that are there, the more debris gets stirred and hence the higher ventilation rates. The other thing is, your respiratory rate, you're breathing at three to four times the amount as a sedentary person would be breathing. So there's lots of stuff coming out of your mouth, tons of airflow coming out of your mouth, expelling CO2 as you suck oxygen in, but as it expels CO2, all of your germs go with it, right? And then additionally, you're sweating, and that doesn't, hasn't been proven to be a COVID-related thing at the moment, uh, but they keep adding to things that cause COVID, so, or spread COVID, so I don't know. Um, but there are germs that are spread when you sweat as well um, from your skin touching. Um, so there's lots of reasons for these very high ventilation rates. 
So we got to get these ventilation rates into the building. Many of these facilities that you guys have, uh, have, have what I call packaged rooftop units or what the industry calls packaged rooftop units. They look like this photo that I have over here. So there's a system that has a gas heater in it and it has a compressor and it has coils in it and it has fans in it and it does all of the heating and cooling for the whole entire space, right? It's not like your house where you have an air conditioner in the yard and a furnace inside. It's all in one box and it's sitting on your roof. That's the most common thing that we'd have for these types of fitness centers. Most of these have or should have a hood like I'm showing right here on the end, this gray triangular piece where outside air gets sucked up into there. We don't just have a, a wide opening on there because then rain and stuff can get there. So there's like a little awning, if you will, a little rain hood and all the outside air can get sucked up in there where it can go through the filters, the heating, the cooling system, and then go through the duct system to be delivered over to the occupants. So that CFM that we needed, 20 CFM per person plus a certain amount per square foot, this damper right here has to be set for that amount. Um, if you don't know if you have the right amount, uh, you should have that checked. Chances are really good you don't have the right amount because it's pretty notorious that these things are set up incorrectly. Um, so there's numerous ways we can check that. Um, with airflow measurement tools, or we can measure temperatures and, and estimate the airflow based on that. But it can be done. There's an entire trade of people that do that. They're called air balancers um, or tab contractors, test and air balance contractors. And they check airflows on all kinds of equipment and water flows, including this kind of outside air intake. So we'll make sure we're at least getting the code or required amount of air in there. Now, in some cases, you may have heard things about uh, recommendations about overventilating space, providing more than the code required amount of airflow. That's a possibility, uh, but if you're going to do that, you have to keep in mind that the piece of equipment you have wasn't sized for that. So it may work out fine in November, but come January, you might not have enough heat anymore. So think really hard before you decide to make a system overventilate beyond what it was designed for. But at least get it up to the code ventilation because it was designed for that, hopefully. So at least get to that point so you're not not breaking the general uh, rules as, as they stand. Now, because it is a really large amount of outside air, there is a technology that we can use to modulate the amount of outside air. So we don't always have the exact same amount of ventilation air. Now the code says, yeah, you gotta bring all this ventilation air in, but there's another section of the code that says you can modulate the people portion. The building portion, you can't modulate. You, you gotta bring that in. Whenever the building's open, you gotta bring this column in, a certain amount per square foot, because the building size isn't changing on the fly. But the people portion, you could modulate because the people size or the people quantity does change on the fly as the building's operating. So that type of system is called a demand control ventilation system. So what we do in those cases is if, you're, if your basketball facility or whatever you have is designed for 100 people, I'm going to make a nice even number for myself, 100 people, but I only have 20 people there. Well, 100 times 20 CF per person, that's 2,000 cubic feet per minute of outside air. That's a lot of air. For those of you that know air conditioning, that's five tons of airflow. It's a lot of airflow for those people. But if I only got 20 people there, then it's 400 instead of 2,000 that I need to bring in for those people. And I still got to bring the building square footage portion in too. But it's a lot less airflow that I got to bring in, which means it's less energy to heat and cool it. We've used demand control mm -hmm. ventilation for, dang, I don't know. I think I did my first system in 1999 um, for a system that I installed. We've used it and industry's used it a little longer than that. And it became really uh, easy to comply with code in 2006 when the codes got modified uh, to easily allow these kind of systems. Before that, you had to ask for special permission. Now it's, it's easy to do via code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a CO2 sensor, carbon dioxide sensor. I mentioned previously, when you're breathing, you're breathing oxygen in and you're exhaling carbon dioxide out. So if I want to know how many people are in the gym, I could stand at the door with a clipboard and check off all your names and then turn a ventilation dial or something. Or I could put CO2 sensors in the space and the more you breathe, the more the CO2 increases and then I can automatically increase the ventilation. And then when people leave and there's less of you there, I can start throttling the ventilation back. That way I can make sure I always get the code required amount of ventilation for all my occupants, but only the occupants that showed up that day, not the ones that the building was designed for. This is pretty key for a lot of the fitness centers because most of you guys are not operating at full capacity right now, either because your state or county said you can't do it or because you're just trying to space people out more. And you're saying, you know what? We're only using every other workstation, right? Or something like that. 
um, or instead of two people working out together in a, in a workstation, you only can have one there, whatever the rules are that you have at your facility. So there's less people than there might normally be. So you need less ventilation air. So let's throttle that back to save a little bit of energy, but still get the right amount of ventilation air. So that CO2, that carbon dioxide you're breathing out, it's important to note that CO2 is not CO. This gets confused all the time. So I literally had to make a slide for it. Um, carbon dioxide is what you're breathing out of your mouth. It's in the air all the time. It's in our atmosphere. There's tons of it everywhere. You breathe it in on accident. It's all everywhere. Carbon monoxide, CO, is totally different. That's a byproduct of incomplete combustion. So if you got a campfire going, a fireplace, uh, your stove, uh, your furnace, something like that has, when it's burning the fuel, there's a, there's a byproduct of it being carbon monoxide. And we want that to go out the flue and leave the facility. Or in the case of your guys' equipment on the roof, never come into the facility. That is totally different. Those two things are separate from each other. Carbon dioxide is not harmful. You could easily Google articles saying that carbon dioxide is harmful. Yeah, when you get to really, really high amounts, way beyond what you see in a building. So normally what we see in a building is going to be something in the, what I normally see is like 1,000, 1,500 parts per million, something like that in that range, uh, 500 parts per million on the really low end. The lower the carbon dioxide level that we read, the better ventilated your space actually is. So to be harmful, I'd have to have, whoops, sorry about that. I'd have to have something up towards 30,000 parts per million, which is a crazy amount of carbon dioxide in the air. And even if you stuck your face in a bag, it would take like a good half an hour to get to that level. So it's a crazy amount before it becomes harmful. Maybe not a half an hour, maybe a little faster. Um, but then levels we have in buildings are not that high. So we're just using it not to determine if the air is safe. We're determined, using it to determine how many people are there so I know how much fresh air to bring in. Normally what we're doing is we're going to look at the outdoor level and let's say it's 400 parts per million outside, that's the fresh air. And I'm gonna set my system up to be about 700 parts per million above the outdoor air level. So probably like 1100 parts per million I'll have as my setting. And if it gets higher than that, I tell the system to bring me more fresh air in. And if it gets lower than that, I say, yeah, you can back off on the fresh air. I got a lot of it right now. The good news is people breathe at really predictable rates. They exhale a certain amount of CO2 and that CO amount of CO2 is directly related to whatever they're doing. So it's very it's very predictable. Your metabolic rate, your activity level, determines how much oxygen you have to suck in and hence how much CO2 you spit out. So if you're sitting at your desk, let's just say you're right here and you're breathing and exhaling a certain amount, but then let's say you go on the treadmill, you're literally one, two, three times the amount. But it's a known amount, it's easily calculated, we can look it up in tables. And then if I double the amount of people in a room, I go from 10 people to 20 people, I double the amount of CO2. If I go up by a tenfold, I go up by tenfold on CO2. So it's linear, meaning that the more CO2, the more people I definitely have. Let's look and see how that actually is going to save somebody a little bit of energy. This chart's a little bit busy, and I understand that. Um, down on the bottom axis over here at the zero line, that's no fresh air. Up at the 100 line is the 100% of the code required fresh air. And that's not as far as your damper can necessarily open. It's just as much as you need to comply with code. And then this is hours of the day down here. So this facility, when they opened up, I don't remember this was, I think this was an office building. Uh, I probably should have did a better job and picked a different building, but let's say it's an office building. I think it was. At seven or eight in the morning is when the building goes open. If they had a normal traditional system, they would turn their ventilation system on, suck fresh outside air in for everybody all day long. And then at whatever time that is, six o'clock, they would shut it back off. And they run in their nighttime mode. The purple shows what happens when we measure the CO2 in the space and modulate the ventilation based on who actually shows up. So believe it or not, unrelated to COVID, this is pre-COVID, this chart, everybody doesn't show up for work on time. I know that's pretty shocking, right? So people kind of trickle in when they trickle in. So I can get a little bit of savings there by not going to the full ventilation rate right away. I can start tweaking the ventilation rate as they start showing up. And then by like 9, 10 in the morning, pretty much everybody's there, but not everybody because somebody isn't there that day, somebody's sick, somebody went on vacation, somebody did whatever, so they're not all there. So I never actually get up to the full design, hardly ever. And then in the case of an office building, some people leave for lunch in the middle of the day, right? And they come back. There's a profile like this for every type of facility. For a lot of you guys, like if you have a fitness center, uh, there's gonna be a pretty decent hump early in the morning when people try to get in before work. And then there's gonna be a decent hump after work. And then tell me if I'm wrong, but you're probably gonna have another hump later on after dinner. 
seems like the, whenever I go to a gym, that's what I'm, I'm noticing as far as population counts there, right? If you have a, a volleyball facility or something like that, you probably have nothing going on in the day. And then maybe you have a couple little things in the evening and then the weekends you're packed, right? And every facility has some predictable pattern like that. And we can calculate the savings based on that. Now, the other thing you could do is you could use your demand ventilation system, your CO2 sensors in reverse. So by that, I mean, instead of designing the system for the code required amount of airflow and letting the CO2 sensor throttle it back when less people are there, if I wanted to during COVID times, I could jack that ventilation rate up and then as more people come in, increase it even more. So instead of going down when people aren't there, I can increase it when they are there and go above the code required amount if you want to. There's some issues that could happen with that, mainly that your equipment isn't sized to handle that from a heating and cooling set point standpoint and from a dehumidification standpoint. Uh, this chart that we're looking at here specifically, um, this was based on some recommendations back in May when, uh, when ASHRAE and hence the CDC who was following ASHRAE's lead said, hey, it might make a lot of sense to uh, bring a little more ventilation air in than you normally would to help dilute down the pollutants and specifically COVID in the space. So some buildings did take that advice, but this is what happened on a lot of these buildings. This is their humidity level down here where they're in the 35, 40% range. And then when they started doubling up their ventilation, now all of a sudden the building's up in higher humidities, 55, 60, 65, on some days, 74% humidity. You never wanna be above 60%. Bad stuff happens above 60% like mold growth. So it sometimes is ill-advised to go above the code amount of ventilation air, unless your system was designed to handle that. And some of the things we'll show you later today can actually handle that if you wanna do that. Uh, if you watch module one, uh, and hopefully you all did, if not, go back and watch it um, from Wednesday. Uh, if you watch module one, you probably saw that when things are really dry in a space, certain bad stuff thrives, certain bacteria and viruses do really well. By really well, I mean they do well, not us. And then when things are really humid, the same kind of thing happens. There's certain bacteria and viruses that thrive and then fungus and mold really thrives. And if I can keep stuff between like 40 and 60, 30 and 60%, less bad things happen. This chart shows uh, 30 and 60% because it's a little bit older chart. Uh, most of the COVID related recommendations are based on the study data on how well it survives. If you saw in module one, you know what I'm talking about. I'm looking more for like 40 to 60 range or even 45 to 55 if I want to tighten it up. So we kind of already detailed that, so I won't, I won't beat that horse dead, but I want to get in that middle range there. So if I'm trying to do a good job of controlling humidity in my space, and by the way, fitness centers and gyms are some of the tougher places to take care of humidity, because not only are there people in there running around, generating a lot of extra heat, but they're also sweating, and that's latent heat. So we have two kinds of heat, if you didn't know that your body gives off. Sensible heat, which is temperature, and latent heat, which is moisture heat, not just your body, but lots of processes have that, but your body is doing that as well. So I have to get rid of all the heat you're making and I have to get rid of all the moisture you're making because your body is sweating and it's evaporating off your skin and going into the air. And now it's in my air and I have to bring that back to my air handling equipment, my rooftop or my air handler or my furnace or whatever I got. I have to pull that moisture out of that air and then send you the dry air back so it can absorb more moisture from your occupants and your athletes. So your normal system, even at your house, is doing that. It's pulling moisture out of the air. And that's why if you go look at that coil, that A coil that sits above your furnace in your basement at home, there's a little plastic PVC line that comes out of it. And in the summertime, when your system is running cooling, there's water draining down there and going into your sewer. You hear it trickling down. It's pulling moisture out of your air and dumping it into the sewer so your house will not be as humid. It does that as a function of cooling your house. Um, so some small portion of it's doing the dehumidification and moisture removal, and then a large portion is doing the cooling part. But when I have a fitness center or a gym or a wrestling room or a karate dojo or whatever it is, I don't want it to be like that. A little bit of latent moisture removal and a lot of cooling. I need it to shift. I need a little more balance there. I need to remove a lot of moisture because people are sweating like crazy. So there are things that we can do to remove extra moisture in your space. Uh, and like, so an office building, we usually wouldn't do this because it's an office building. There's not a lot of moisture, right? But for gyms and fitness centers all day long. Uh, so one of the things we can do, if, if depending on the kind of equipment you have, is I could design this coil. So the coil that sits above your furnace at home, that same kind of coil, it's called an evaporative coil, or evaporator coil. It's in your equipment in your commercial building as well. 
or a bigger version of it is. And his job in life is to send cold refrigerant through this coil back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and send it back to the outdoor unit or back to the condensing unit to get cooled again while we blow air across it. And if this temperature of this coil surface gets below the dew point of the air, we pull moisture out of the air. Just like if you go uh, in the summertime, it's all humid or whatever, and you go to bed and you wake up in the morning and there's, there's moisture all over your, your windshield of your car, right? It got colder outside. So the surfaces, i.e. the windshield, got down to the dew point of the air and then the moisture couldn't be held in the air anymore. There's just too much of it for that temperature air. So it condenses out. I want that to happen on purpose so I can pull the moisture out of your building. There are some things I can do to make it happen more. So instead of a little bit of water dropping, droplets dropping, I want a lot. So one thing I can do is instead of having just one row of coil, I could put two coils in there and get more surface area or three or four or six or eight. There's all kinds of scenarios like that, depending on the complexity of my equipment, where I can have all these coils lined up. And as it goes to the first one, it gets cooled and dehumidified a little bit, and then it's cooled and dehumidified, and then it's just barely cooled, but really dehumidified, and then it's like dehumidified crazy, right? So I can make more coils, more rows in there. I could also put more fins on there. I don't know if you see these little black lines on there, but those are fins on there. Their job is to uh, spread out the surface area of the coil. Uh, you, if you have never looked at the one above your furnace, you've probably at least seen the condensing unit in your yard at home. Uh, and it has coils that are very similar on there. It's the same kind of thing. Those same little fins you used to push with your finger and write your name on your neighbor's condensing unit. Those kind of fins are in the coil on the inside of the equipment as well. I could put more of those fins in there. Now that does make it harder to put air through there when I put a bunch of extra metal in the way, but I can get more surface area and dehumidify that way. I could also put on as a, and it's, it's difficult to do that as a retrofit, like whatever coil you already have, you're probably stuck with it right now. Like when you go get a new piece of equipment, okay, we can do something different. Uh, but right now you're probably stuck with what you got. But as a retrofit solution, one thing I can do is I can install a variable frequency drive, a VFD on the fan system. And then even though I'm not getting more coil surface area, I can run the airflow through that coil more slowly by providing less airflow with that adjustable fan that I just made. And now it stays in contact with the coil longer and it can dehumidify better that way. So we will oftentimes put variable frequency drives on air handling systems like this to save energy, to save fan energy, but we can also do it on there to try to do a better job dehumidifying. The other thing we can do, um, and, that, and, that, and that VFD is extremely easy to retrofit in terms of all these options, the easiest of these four. The other thing we can do is we can get better compressor capacity control. There's numerous ways to do that. So I'm going to explain those on a couple other slides here. And then we can also do what's called hot, hot gas reheat or a beefed up version of that called humidimizer. And I'll explain that on a separate slide also. So if I put the VFD on, other than slowing the fan down for dehumidification, there's a massive energy savings benefit, mainly because a lot of fans are oversized in America, like, like everything else is oversized, you know, cars and houses and everything else. But we oversize fans too, surprise, surprise. So if I had a, a, a very large fan, or maybe I had four very large fans for my, uh, for my indoor uh, facility, my basketball gym or whatever it is, and they're costing me a thousand bucks a month to run. If I slowed them all down to 75%, you would think it would only cost me 750, but it actually cost me 420. It's not a linear relationship. When a fan slows down, its electrical consumption drops like a rock as compared to the amount of air it's moving. So I really don't want to operate it at full speed if I can avoid it. I want to always want to try to find ways to get that thing to be slower. If I cut the speed in half, 50%, it's only going to cost me 125 bucks instead of a thousand. Uh, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty impressive way to start saving some energy on the building, which is great, but I really want to do it so I can dehumidify better so I can keep COVID and other stuff under control, other germs. Most germs don't thrive when it's middle humidity. Um, and there's pretty good paybacks on VFDs from an energy standpoint and rebates from your utility and all kinds of stuff like that. Capacity control. So most of you have systems that are what I'm going to call single stage. It's on off at your house. You, you have, you definitely have to set your house unless you paid extra for something different. Um, and at your, your, uh, your gym at your fitness facility, you probably also only have single stage equipment. Um, that means it turns on and then it turns off and there's no other scenario. It's either 100% on or it's zero. It'd be like me giving you a car, but not giving you an accelerator pedal. It's just, you just turn it on and it immediately goes hundred miles an hour. You turn it off and it stops and there's nothing in between. That's what it's like. It's that crazy. Um, but when it does that, 
a single stage system like this, it'll meet the set point on the thermostat really quick. So if you set your thermostat for 72 degrees, it'll get to 72 really quick. And that sounds good. Like, oh yeah, let's get there quick. Let's get it done, right? It's actually not. I want it to happen slowly because the longer it takes to do it, that means the longer that this coil stays cold, which means the longer I pull moisture out of there. So I want it to be a slow process. So one thing I might do is put two compressors in instead of one compressor. And that allows me to run at half capacity or at 100% capacity. So if everybody's not in the gym that day, it'll only need to use one compressor, which not only saves energy, but it takes a little longer to run, which helps me dehumidify better. Sometimes instead of two compressors, you might have units that have one compressor, but it has like two steps to it. So that might happen as well. This one runs at 66% or 100%. And then even now, the systems are getting more unique where we're having ones that fully modulate too. But that's that's pretty special. Um, there's things we can do as a retrofit. So these compressors, whatever you got now, you got. It's, you're not changing that until it becomes time to put a new piece of equipment in. We just changed out one of the rooftops on one of my classrooms, uh, and it had an oversized single-stage unit. I put a smaller unit in with two stages, and the dehumidification has been awesome. Uh, it used to be horrible in that room. Papers would curl and stuff. Uh, now it's been great. Um, so let me explain the refrigeration cycle to you in a kind of a, a brief version of it. So this is every refrigeration cycle. So this is every air conditioner that everybody's building our house does. And there may be a few unique things out there, but everybody on this call, this is definitely what you have. Um, so there's four major pieces. There's that evaporator coil that I was talking about. He's the one that I want him to get really cold. So water condenses on them and then the water drains away. Then you have the coil that's outside the building and that guy's going to reject heat. So the one inside, his job is to absorb all of the heat and then he pumps it over to the outdoors where he can reject it. For right now, you can think of this compressor as my pump. He moves this, heat, this, this fluid, this refrigerant that got heated up, he moves them outside where he can dump that heat to your yard out or top of your building or wherever it is, and he moves his way back through. And then this guy's job is to meter that refrigerant back into the evaporator. The, comp, the process is a little more complex than that. Um, and if you want, we have a whole like 15 minute video on our on our YouTube page that goes through it in great detail. Uh, but that's pretty much the jobs here. This guy absorbs heat. He sends it outside where he dumps it away. Absorbs heat, dumps it away, absorbs heat, dumps it away. So one of the things we can do to improve the humidity control in the space for spaces that have a lot of humidity, other than the stuff I mentioned, which is variable speed fans and more staging and all that kind of stuff, I can install something called a hot gas bypass. Um, so what hot gas bypass does, and this is the same kind of idea, there's that evaporator coil on the indoor side, the condenser coil on the outside. Instead of sending the refrigerant to the condenser coil to be thrown away with its waste heat and get it the heck out of my building, I send some of it over there, but I grab a little bit of it and I send it back into my indoor coil that I'm trying to make cold. So I take this hot gas and I dump it into the inside just a little bit. And I'm thinking, well, why the hell would you do that? That sounds super wasteful. Yeah, it is super wasteful, but it means that I can't make the temperature as cool in your space as quickly, so it has to run longer, so it dehumidifies more. It still eventually gets to the temperature you want, but instead of doing it in five minutes, it takes 15 minutes. I can pull more moisture out that way. So it can be retrofitted. Um, there's actually retrofit kits. There's specifically one called a RAW device. It's a manufacturer. They make a kit that does this. It's a kit that uh, a refrigeration tech would install, not a kit that me, a controls guy, or you, a building operator, would put on. It needs to be piped in on the refrigerant side. But if you have systems that are having trouble keeping up with humidity, you could replace the systems, yes, um, but you could also put on one of these raw devices and try to like band-aid it a little bit. The other thing that we can do is a thing called uh, hot gas reheat. So that was hot gas bypass. That's basically falsely loading the system to, to make it run longer. Hot gas reheat works a little bit different. And the kind of hot gas reheat I'm going to explain to you guys is a thing called humidimizer. So normally your, your system runs off a temperature sensor, a thermostat on the wall. Well, what we're going to do on these systems is have a temperature sensor and a humidity sensor. And both of them can run the system and in different ways. So the normal mode is that the thermostat temperature calls for cooling, turns on the cooling system, brings cold air down your ducts, puts it in the building, all that normal great stuff. The other scenario and that gives me like a typically 55 degree air coming out of my duct. The other scenarios, I have this hot gas reheat mode that we just mentioned. So in that scenario, I don't want any temperature. 
you got it down to whatever I wanted, 72. Great job. You did good. But it's still too humid in here. You got to help me out. It's too humid. So that mode will allow us to dehumidify, but without actually cooling the space very much. So we'll, we'll bring it down to that 55 degree temperature and pull as much moisture as we can out of it. But then what we'll do is we'll temper it back up to like 70 or 75 because you didn't really want any cooling anyway. But I got it down to the dew point and pulled the moisture out first. I got to get cold coils to get the moisture out. Then there's a scenario in which I can run both simultaneously, right, to give you really good dehumidification and humidity, run both coils. Um, and then there's bigger systems as well. Uh, I don't want to scare anybody off by showing you the piping diagrams, but for those that are interested, if you're not interested, just zone out for like four minutes. If you are interested, this is what it looks like. Instead of two coils, one outside and one inside, there's actually a third coil and it goes after the indoor evaporator coil. And it does different jobs depending on which of those modes I just said. So in the normal scenario, this valve closes, this valve opens, and this pipe is basically not there and that coil is basically not there. And all the refrigerant goes around the circle like I just mentioned. Evaporator to compressor, compressor to condenser coil, condenser coil to TXV back through. It just does the normal thing like I said before, nothing special. That's the normal mode when I wanna cool the space. When I want to dehumidify the space but not really cool it, then what ends up happening is instead of sending all this refrigerant to that coil to be rejected outside, I open this valve and shut that valve. And now instead of the refrigerant going around the loop this way, it goes around the loop this way. And this extra bonus coil becomes my condenser coil where the heat gets rejected. But instead of rejecting heat outside the building, I'm rejecting it back into your airflow. So I'm cooling the air, pulling as much moisture as I can out of it, and then I'm gonna temper it back up to 70 degrees so you don't get cold air dumping on you when you didn't wanna cool the building. There is a scenario which I could do both simultaneously, use both coils. So I can send all my refrigerant to this coil and then again through this coil so I can get really good dehumidification and cooling at the same time. Uh, so there's a, a couple different tricks we can do there. This is not something you can retrofit though, but if you were gonna get a new piece of equipment, it could easily be uh, ordered this way. Uh, obviously it costs more, but it does really well for fitness centers. In fact, that's the primary place that we use it. Uh, let me see if anybody typed any questions in. It's like we're good on questions, quiet group. All right, so let's move into air purification. And if you were with us on, uh, Yesterday, we did talk about a couple of these things and I'm gonna repeat them a little bit, but then I'm also gonna add some new information that you probably have not seen yet for those of you that were on the other day or for those of you that follow all of our webinars and watch them every week. So there are several different air purification technologies. Right now I'm showing you three of them on the screen, PCO, Carbon, and Oxy4. And they can be used individually or in combinations with each other. And they all kind of work the same in terms of how they get installed. Basically you just cut a hole in your duct you slide it in and plug it in. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's pretty much how it is. It's super easy to retrofit as opposed to a lot of the other things that we could do in a space. So what is this gonna look like here? Um, there's ones that mount through the duct, there's ones that mount inside the unit with magnets. So the first technology, PCO, photocatalytic oxidation. The photo means there's light involved. So there's a UV bulb in there. We talked about that yesterday and it could kill germs and stuff like that on its own, but it's very limited. But its main job in this case is not to be a germ killer, although it's gonna happen. His main job is to, so to shine on a, a metal cage and act as a catalyst to create oxidizers. Excuse me. And that's how we end up with this term, photocatalytic oxidation. Um, so that's what this process is gonna be. There's three steps to it for most of these applications if you have the PCO and the carbon together. This one right here I'm showing on top does have both of them together. I can tell that visually because the black cartridges on the side are carbon and the top ones on the top are titanium, titanium dioxide, and so this one has both. There's also UV light in there. So if this one was open on the bottom, and there's, there's a four-sided you know, cube, if you will, if the bottom was open, it would have a bulb like this, and it would be shining down on my coil to keep it clean like we talked about before. UV lights, if you didn't join us yesterday, are really good at keeping coils clean. They're not good at cleaning air. The air is moving way too fast for them to purge the germs out of the air at any decent amount. But they're really good at cleaning coils because coils don't move. Those black pieces on there, those carbon cartridges, carbon's really good at absorbing odors. And we do have plenty of odors in a gym, right? Um, especially if you're doing locker rooms and stuff like that. So carbon is really good at absorbing odors, but you have to replace the carbon. If you have a UVC light shining on the carbon, it regenerates it. So you don't have to replace it. 
So because we already had that bulb in there anyway, for other reasons, having it shine on this carbon is a nice benefit. Now, after numerous years, are you gonna wanna replace it? Yeah, you probably will, because the plastic that's holding it is probably deteriorating or whatever. But in general, you don't really have to replace it. The third piece that is that PCO, photocatalytic oxidation. And that's the interesting one for today's purposes, because that's the one that's gonna kill germs. And that's the one that's gonna help us get rid of COVID in some of these spaces. So the white plates on top there are uh, a carbon infused titanium dioxide. So what's titanium dioxide gonna do for us? Well, when the UV light, the bulb in there, shines on the titanium dioxide, that causes the catalytic reaction that is gonna create hydroxyl radicals. If you flash back to high school uh, physics and chemistry, you'll probably recall that radicals are unstable things, unstable compounds. They're highly reactive. So as they get generated, our airflow dumps them into the building and they react with stuff in the space. What are they gonna react with? Everything. They're gonna react with VOCs, they're gonna react with germs, they're gonna react with chemical compounds, and they're gonna start breaking stuff down. They do a really good job at busting up single cell organisms. So my UV bulb shines on the titanium dioxide, it creates oxidizers. Those oxidizers can break down chemicals like we said. They will also conglomerate, because they have a charge to them, conglomerate around small single cell organisms like bacteria, viruses, mold, stuff like that. And when they surround them all, they actually break down their DNA and bust them up. So there's very high uh, test data rates on PCO's ability to kill all kinds of germs. Um, MRSA, bacteria, uh, strep throat, influenza, common cold, all those kinds of things have been tested up and down. Tuberculosis, believe it or not, which is super hard to kill. They've all been tested on that stuff and have pretty decent kill rates on it. So if you were to put this kind of thing in your duct system or in your rooftop or in your air handler and have these oxidizers get sent down into the space, those oxidizers, the, at first, when you first turn on, they're going to spend some time killing germs in the duct. Whatever's growing on the inside of the duct or whatever's floating around there, they're going to kill that. And once they, get, once they react to something and get used up, they're gone, right? But as they keep cleaning that duct, minutes later, they'll be going into your space and coming out of your grills and registers and diffusers into the space and they'll be killing germs in the air. Additionally, they're going to land on surfaces. They're gonna kill stuff in the air first because that's what they're gonna see first. But once the air gets cleaner and cleaner, they will now start landing on surfaces. They will land on countertops. They will la land on bench presses. They will land on wrestling mats. They will land on uh, boxing shields, right? All that stuff is gonna get saturated with this and it's gonna keep working on killing those germs. Does that mean you should stop mopping the floor? No, keep mopping the mats, right? You still have to keep doing that but it's gonna help out in between and help kill some of those extra germs that are generated by the people that are in there. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I, I get a lot of questions from people, especially this year and from people in my neighborhood and my school district saying, damn, I wish they would just like make something that kills germs, like just kills it out of the air. And I'm like, we've had this stuff forever. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, I had another version of this at my house Nine years ago, I put in I put in a FIDI device, photohydroionization, very similar to PCO. Um, I have PCO now, but I had five back then for like six years. It was fantastic. I went three years with nobody in my house getting sick from anybody else at all. Zero, none. And then after three years, somebody got sick. It turned out my bulb had died. I had not changed it like I should have. So my wife said like, yeah, I think maybe your little germ zapper down there in the basement isn't working because you know one of your kids is sick now. So I went down there, swapped the bulb out. I swear to God, I had another three years of nobody getting sick. It was fantastic. And then of course the bulb died again. And I was like, what the hell? And then, okay. So now I changed the bulb on a regular schedule. I'm on year nine now of this kind of technology. So I'm, I'm better at it than I was. Um, so that is gonna be the one downside. If you put this in your gym, you're gonna have to change bulbs. Most of the current technology has one year change on the bulbs. It's a couple hundred bucks. I get it. Nobody wants to do that. They wanna, they wanna spend a couple hundred bucks. They don't wanna go change it or have somebody change it. But if it keeps your building open and keeps people from getting sick, I mean, even right now, if you're supposed to be closed and you're open anyway, um, as people get sick at your gym, you're hopefully telling them not to come back for a while. And you're telling anybody that was working out with them, because you're hopefully tracking that, that they can't come back for like 10 days or whatever the limit is. So you're kind of hurting business by having people constantly have to, to not be back at the gym. So you really want to make sure that people stay healthy when they're at your facility. So that way they can keep using your facility, which is how you make money. Or at least you make money by selling memberships and hopefully they use it. But if they don't, they're not going to renew their membership either. So you got to kind of got to work with them a little bit. You can go a step up from this, this PCO, 
Uh, the one I have in my house right now is called an Oxy4. It does everything that PCO does that look, looks just like it. Instead of the carbon cartridges on the sides though, it has the titanium dioxide on all four sides. It's just totally covered in titanium dioxide. So it creates a lot of oxidizers, a boatload of oxidizers. Additionally, it has a different style of bulb in it than the other ones have. So it creates a fourth oxidizer. So it creates the same three oxidizers that, that the PCO does, hydroperoxides, superoxides, and oxide ions. But then it creates one more, which is an oxidizing ion, hence the name Oxy4. It creates a fourth oxidizer. So it does a really good job of killing stuff. In fact, I don't know anything. We do a lot of indoor air quality technologies at our office, and there's not too many things we have that rival this in terms of what it can kill uh, in the air and in the space. I mean, it's landing on desks, doorknobs, everything. It's killing germs everywhere, it's just saturating the space with oxidizers. Now, with that being said, you don't want to put in too big of a system because if the oxidizers don't have anything to react with, then people will start smelling them and noticing it. Um, some people like the smell. I personally like it. It smells, this is so weird, but like when you go to the dentist office and they open up that bag of tools that's like all sealed up that they get from their cleaning company, you get like this, this smell, this little woof that comes by your face. It's like a metallic smell. That's what this smells like. It's the exact same kind of smell. I like it. To me, it's like the smell of cleanliness. Other people hate it and they don't want to smell it. So you want to size it big enough to kill the germs that you have um, for the kind of system that you have, but you don't want it to be like really oversized and then people notice it, right? So they do come in different sizes for that reason. Um, there's a seven inch, nine inch, and 16 inch. And as you'd expect, as you get longer ones, they give off more stuff. We size them based on the airflow of your system. So we can look at your system, know how much airflow it moves, put an appropriately sized purifier in there um, to accommodate that. The ones I'm showing you here, these two, they slide through a duct. Uh, there's also ones that go on the inside. So if you want to put it in your equipment instead of in your duct, there's like magnets on there because you don't want to drill something to the, to the outside of your rooftop unit and then it's going to leak water from the rain. So it goes on the inside with magnets instead. Um, you do have to change the bulbs every year. Uh, it says six to 12 month lifespan. I've never had to do one faster than, than 12 months. Um, so it's pretty much a year. Um, even like the little residential ones even have timers on them for people. Commercially, they don't because a commercial building and no one's going to see the screen to see the timer so why would it matter so they don't bother putting a screen on them uh, you can tandem these up if you want so if one 16 inch isn't big enough for your system you could tandem a couple together um, two is about the most we do i mean you could put a bunch on there you could put like 18 on there if you want for some giant system but at some point it becomes less and less practical so two of them tandem together which will handle about a 20 ton system which is probably Everything at all your guys' buildings is probably less than that, unless you were one of those uh, sports domes, kind of, you know, a whole soccer field type place that we were talking about. Those, those things would be bigger. But for uh, volleyball, basketball, uh, floor hockey, anything like that, um, row houses, any of those kind of, those kind of things, it's going to be under that size. All right, the new piece of information that you probably have not seen yet, or if you did, you just recently saw it. Uh, Respicare, who makes these Oxy4 devices, just had all of their stuff say just it was all summer long that they had the testing going but they just published like a week and a half ago their test results um, and then in our world we waited a little bit until we got all of the data and test results before we published anything which I believe we did yesterday during my webinar is when my office published it so I didn't say anything during the webinar because I've learned my lesson in years past about prematurely announcing anything so until it's official it's, it's usually like zip my lip um, so but now yesterday it was officially announced that this has been tested on the SARS-CoV-2 virus and it kills 99% of that, of those germs. And it does it in a really fast pace, like seconds. So some of our technologies we have, have data showing that they kill 99% um, in like 30 minutes, which is fantastic. This is in seconds. This is like, just eradicate everything. Now that PCO type device I was talking about, this one here would be a PCO type device with uh, the, titanium dioxide here and the carbon on the sides. This is the Oxy4. This, this one is the one that will kill the most stuff. And they have a couple other versions of it as well, of these kind of technologies. Uh, so that's there for your, uh, your enjoyment. Um, if you have anybody who's uh, wanting things that are, I don't wanna say the word guaranteed because it's so hard to guarantee things that are done correctly, but uh, that have proof that this actually kills COVID. All right. And that leads us to bipolar ionization. Um, I did talk about this the other day as well. Uh, so I'll do it in a little bit of a quick fashion for those of you that have already seen it. 
Um, this is a similar technology to what the PCO stuff was, but it's not bulb based. So there's no bulbs to change on here. Instead, you have to clean these little needles instead. So there's a little bit of maintenance. Um, so instead of swapping bulbs once a year, you're cleaning needles every six months or something like that. It's not hard to clean these needles. You just brush them off. What happens is that dust and debris sticks to them and then they don't work anymore. Uh, they used to make them out of metal. They no longer do that. Now they're like, a, I think it's nylon, a nylon brush, but you got to wipe them off. So you got to go out each one of your systems, wipe them off, wipe them off, next system, wipe them off, wipe them off. It's called bipolar ionization because there's two poles, one, two, two needles. So one of these needles charges stuff positive, one charges stuff negative. I want the airflow to go through this way. So some of the airflow gets charged positive, some gets charged negative. I don't want to install it like this and charge something positive and then charge the same thing back the other way. I want half the things to be positive and half negative because then positive and negative things can be attracted to each other, which is part of what this guy is going to try to do on purpose. So this guy's main job in life is to create a plasma field that generates these ions. Ions occur naturally anyway. Um, we're just going to forcefully make them in your air handling system and use your duct system to send them around. Now, they have a pretty short lifespan. They decay over time, and the time is pretty quick. you got like a minute to use these things up. So we're going to make them in your air handler, send them down the duct, give them some time to react with stuff, and then they're gone, just like that. And we're going to make more, send them down the duct, and rinse and repeat kind of thing. If you had really, really, really big systems with long duct work, we would try to do stuff to get these things further down the duct work so they can have enough time to get into the space. If you have small systems like most of you have, we could put them right into your air handling system, right into your rooftop unit, and you only have 30 feet of duct, so it's not a problem. You don't have 800 feet. So the way this guy works is he's going to create these positive ions and these negative ions. These ions have this charge now, and they're going to seek out and try to attach to other stuff so they are going to break down chemicals. They are going to attack viruses and bacteria. And by doing that, they, they essentially uh, surround them because they're, they're, they're charged. So they're clinging onto each other because positive and negative whole deal, right? So like here, we're showing a positive hydrogen and a, and a negative O2. And those guys are going to stick to each other because of the positive negative deal. And the more of them that clump around this, whatever this is, a bacteria, let's just say it is, it's going to basically suffocate them from what they need to breathe. They don't really breathe, but uh, it suffocates them from the hydrogen that they need. We need oxygen to stay alive. They need hydrogen. It's cutting them off from their hydrogen supply. And then that'll end up ripping apart their uh, DNA wall structure. Um, in, in regards to chemicals in this space, uh, most of these bipolar ionizers operate at 12 volts, 12 electron volts. And hence, they can attack any chemical that has an electron volt uh, uh, representation lower than that. So they'll break down uh, alcohols and formaldehyde and ammonia, but they're not going to do anything for things like oxygen. Thankfully, we need that uh, methane, methane or anything that's above 12. But if you're cleaning stuff and wiping it down with alcohol in the gym to kill germs on surfaces, great. Then it'd be, it'd be great if that alcohol stuff wasn't floating around in the air. Let's get rid of it. I got a quick example here showing ammonia, which is something you don't want to breathe a lot of either. And it also is a cleaning agent. Uh, it is three parts hydrogen, one part nitrogen. When that ammonia goes through the plasma field that the bipolar ionizer create, created, it busts those things apart. Now, those things could rejoin together as ammonia, three parts hydrogen, one part nitrogen. But that's not very likely because it's a fairly complex molecule. They're more likely to combine into more benign, simple molecules. So those hydrogens may jump on an oxygen that's in the air and create H2O. I'm good with that. H2O doesn't hurt anybody. The nitrogens that are out there, they may glob onto each other, two of them together, and create N2. That's the same nitrogen that we have in the air we breathe in the atmosphere. I know you think about breathing oxygen and all that, but 80-some percent of the air is like nitrogen. So it's not harmful at all. So I'll break it down into less complex molecules and hopefully less harmful. Um, it does create these, uh, these clusters of things because we're charging it. And because I'm having things clustered with positive and negative charge, Whatever small things I had, once they clump together in a group of five or six or 10 of them, they're no longer a small thing. They're a big thing. They're a large particle. Well, if you remember before from yesterday, it's really hard to get small particles back to my air handling system, right? The whole example with wind blowing a sail. Well, if the mass has no sail on it, it's just a stick. The wind's going to mostly go around it and I'm not going to move the boat very fast. But if I put the sail up, it's a big surface area. Now, when the wind comes along, it's able to push the boat pretty quickly. Same kind of idea. I got a little tiny particle. A lot of the airflow is going to miss it and go around it. The bigger it gets, 
the easier it is to print it in the airflow. Why do I want it in the airflow? If it goes through the airflow, it can get to my filter. And now that it's a big clump of something, relatively speaking, it's more likely to get stuck in my filter. And then as I mentioned, it's also gonna clump around viruses and bacteria and any, any organism for that matter. Um, and those little small ones are gonna get suffocated from their, uh, from their uh, uh, hydrogen that they need to survive. So those positive negative ions react together. They form these hydroxyls that are clumped around these pathogens and that suffocates them from the necessary hydrogen to live. I shouldn't say live or kill. Viruses are not alive or dead. Um, they, they're, uh, they need a host to survive, whereas bacteria can survive on its own, right? Viruses can't, so technically it's not alive. So like my office keeps yelling at me and saying, stop, stop saying we're killing viruses. We're inactivating them because they were never alive to begin with. I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. Um, I showed you this chart yesterday as well. The MERV rating is how good your filter is. If you recall, ASHRAE is recommending MERV 14 or MERV 13 type filters in this range over here, which would do for MERV 13, 46% of the uh, SARS uh, viruses could be caught that way. If I combine that with an ionizer, like we're talking about here, instead of 46%, it's 98.8. And if you're lucky enough to somehow get HEPA filters in your building that are already 99%, you can make them even better with an ionizer. That's kind of like, you know, awesomeness. You're not going to have that at most of these buildings, but you could upgrade from a MERV 8 to a MERV 13, put an ionizer in and get basically 99%. That's not just ASHRAE, which is what this study was, um, but there are other test groups that are also coming up with similar results, getting your regular filters to operate better when combined with a bipolar ionizer. The manufacturer that we use is GPS. I think I mentioned that to most of you guys uh, previously. Uh, they make all kinds of widgets for these kind of applications. There's a couple that I'm going to point out to you because they're a little bit better for the kind of buildings we're talking about today. Um, so we got ones that we can mount in the air handling system, ones we can mount in the duct system, uh, all kinds of other places as well. But these are the ones you're mostly going to see. If you have small package due to rooftop units on your roof, kind of like the picture I showed earlier, and you got three, four, five, six ton rooftops, you're probably going to be using this guy here. This guy mounts inside the uh, fan section of that piece of equipment. It wires to the power that's already available in there, uh, which is 24 volts. So that's easy to power up, low voltage. And the other cool thing is it has these little uh, wipers on them. So instead of you having to go clean these needles, wipe them off every six months or whatever, every day or every other day, I forget, uh, it just it and wipes that thing off for you. There's a little tiny motor in there, just slaps it around a little bit, knocks the debris off it and away it goes. So it's self-cleaning, if you will. There's a larger version of that. So if you got bigger systems, this guy has a big brother. It works very similar. Uh, you can mount it with screws or uh, it comes with magnets if you want to do it that way. And instead of having little wipers, this guy's got a helicopter style blade, but it does the same thing. It spins around once and wipes off those needles every day. There's a duct mounted version. Um, so this has been more common when I don't really have access to the air handling system. Let's say I'm in a, in a in the downtown building and there's an air handler that serves like five tenants there and I'm just one tenant and I'm not allowed to touch the air handler and how it works. I could put one of these in the duct that goes to my suite and just deal with me, right? Um, so this guy just sticks to the duct. This display sits on the outside of the duct and then this white box goes into the duct, if you will. And once again, it's got a helicopter on there to wipe off the two needles. Now, if you get to bigger systems, um, like you're doing some of those large sports fields, like a, a, an indoor soccer field, or you're doing uh, you're doing uh, basketball courts, courts or an ice rink or something of that nature, uh, indoor lacrosse, um, whatever you're doing that requires like larger space and hence bigger pieces of mechanical equipment. Uh, there's a system called iMod that can be, I don't wanna say custom, it's, it's, it's kind of custom. We, we, we choose a custom for the, your system, but we buy it in pieces. Um, and then we erect or set it. It's basically like little Lego blocks and they kind of snap together, if you will. So we figure out all the dimensions that we need and we order enough blocks and then in the field, we connect them all together. Uh, and it has all those same little, it has a whole bunch, instead of two, it has just dozens of these little uh, bipolar needles all over the place. So there's a positive one, then a negative, a positive, negative, positive, negative, all the way down the list. You do have to clean these ones manually. There's no little wiper on them. So every six months or so, you just take a little alcohol wipe and you just put it on your finger and you just run your finger down it, and wipe them off that way. Uh, this is what it looks like installed in a large air handling system. There's one, two, three bars on this guy, it looks like. Um, and this one gets installed at the coil. The nice thing is it helps keep your coil clean. 
and it sends ions down into the space. And there's a little power supply module that goes with it. Just like the Respicare one I showed you, GPS, that specific manufacturer of bipolar uh, ionizing technology, also has testing data for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, their original data from June, they were the first ones to have anything tested, was 99.4% after 30 minutes. They're now at, I think, 99.9% uh, kill rate. So the, uh, the Respicare one I showed you was 99% in seconds. This one's 99.9% .9 in minutes, right? So uh, you can think about that however you want. Uh, the benefit of the bipolar ionizer from GPS is that there's no bulb to change. The Respicare one is probably going to kill stuff faster, the Oxy-4. So there's a little trade-off there. Um, in either case, either one of them is way better than what most people are doing now, which is absolutely nothing. Uh, and then the GPS, just like the Respicare one, they're both tested on all kinds of viruses and bacteria to kill all kinds of stuff. COVID, by the way, is actually fairly easy to kill compared to some of the stuff that they've been tested on and trying to kill. It's actually not that bad. Um, but we got to do stuff to try to kill it. Or not kill it. I said it again. To inactivate it. My apologies. If you're going to do one of these things, uh, and I don't, I don't think there's any... Those are the only two, honestly, and I'm not saying this because my company reps them. We have other products as well, but those are the only two, GPS uh, and uh, Respicare Oxy-4 are the only two products I'm aware of that have been tested for SARS-CoV-2 specifically. There are other products, including some that we sell, that have been tested on coronaviruses because a lot of manufacturers could quickly get their hands on coronavirus to test, but getting their hands on COVID this summer was a little bit harder. So you might see something that says, yeah, we kill coronavirus. Okay, yeah, you do. The old coronaviruses, like one of the old ones, like regular SARS, right? But does it kill SARS-CoV-2? It might, we don't know, it wasn't tested. These two are actually tested for it. Um, last thing I'm gonna leave you with is if you decide to put one of these kind of systems in your building to try to keep things cleaner, one of these air purifiers that I just talked about, um, you probably should let people know. They're kind of invisible. They sit in the air handling system. Nobody sees them. Nobody knows they're there. Your customers don't know. Uh, nobody's aware of it. So what we've been doing in our office is we made a bunch of these door clings. Um, and then for any of the contractors we work with, if they do a maintenance thing with a customer, like one of you guys, and they clean the customer system and maintain it and then install one of these air purifiers, uh, they ask if they could put one of these stickers on the window. Now, the sticker doesn't say the contractor's name. It doesn't say our name. It doesn't say the product name. We thought about all those things because that's good marketing for us, but it doesn't really help you guys, the, the, the building owner. So it's generic. It doesn't have anybody's logo on it. It's just for you to tell your customers when they walk in the front door, we're doing everything we can. Like, we want you guys to come back. We want you to be safe. And we're, and we're telling you that we did. And if they want more information on it, obviously they can ask you, hey, what do you guys put in? Oh, we put this thing in. Oh, can I get one for my house? Yeah, I think they have them for small ones for your house, right? That'd be great. If you don't tell them that too, that's also fine. We want you to keep people safe. All right. Any other questions from anybody? I went three minutes over. I did good yesterday or this morning. I was three minutes under, I think. Today I'm three minutes over. It's a quiet group. I think everybody interrogated me yesterday afternoon. Well, if you do generate any questions, um, my email address is on here. Feel free to send me a note. I'll do my best to, to get your answer for you. I do teach classes every day, all day. So I'll, you'll probably get replies back from me at lunch or in the evening, but I will get information back to you or get you someone in my office that has better information than I have, depending on what your weird question is. Uh, with that, I'm going to end this. It's been recorded. So if you want to have a coworker or a customer or a colleague or someone watch it, it'll be available up on our website later on this evening. So thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it.